Uh, my name is John, and it's been amazing just in one week to see what God is doing in and through your generosity, and we're just getting warmed up. We're just getting started. We've got a little ways to go, but we've got a good start. And really the key question that we're going after this month is this. In the midst of a wounded world, what is your response? Uh, perhaps you've noticed that there are some issues in our world. In fact, every direction you and I look, we can see those. The list is very long. In the midst of a wounded world, what is your response? And our response really needs to probably be like a million different things. Um, a friend of mine uh, has a quote that I love. She says, you were, there is a wrong you were born to make right. And so there's so many different responses that I believe the Spirit of God wants to activate you toward. So many different responses, but there's one collective response I'm hoping and praying and we've been praying that all of us will get on board with and that is to be part of the B4 campaign. You'll get an opportunity to do that today at the end of the service. Uh, today what we're really focusing on is the injustice of sex trafficking. This is a huge issue in our world and certainly in our city. And uh, today we are uh, officially and kind of loudly partnering with an amazing organization that's doing something about it. Uh, the organization is Naomi's House. And so Mission, if we could, they're watching online. Could we just show our love for Naomi's House and our support of them? We love you guys. We're with you. It is a joy to partner with you. And so to Simone and your team and to the women in the house, like we are thrilled because we believe that God created you on purpose, for a purpose. Your past does not determine your future. You are doing the hard work and God is showing up and he is bringing transformation to your life. And so on behalf of Mission, we love you and it is a joy to support and partner with Naomi's house. Again, let me ask, in the midst of a wounded world, what is your response? If you have a Bible, we're starting to look at a story that is so important. Perhaps it's the most famous story Jesus ever told. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. In this story, a lot happens, but certainly uh, Jesus, he indicts the indifferent. He demands that you do something. Uh, he doesn't say just go away from this story and just think about it for a while or just process it for the next 20 years. No, he says do something. This is a story. He demands that we do something in this story. Jesus, who is love, he invites us in to the chief aim of Christianity, which is to live a life of love. If you're there, we're going to start in verse 30, Luke chapter 10, for four weeks. Last week was week one, today is week two. We're spending four weeks in this story, really hoping and praying that this story will speak to us in a powerful way. Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, right, so he saw him, uh, he passed by on the other side. And it says this, but a Samaritan, everyone say that phrase with me, but a Samaritan, good job, but a Samaritan. Which if you understand the context, um, what Jesus is getting at here is the least likely, but a Samaritan, the person that you thought would just walk right by, but a Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Depending on the translation you're reading, it might say pity, it might say compassion, but there is one Greek word underneath it all, which is the word I taught you guys last week. Quick review, if, if you remember this Greek word, I want you to say it loud on the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah, some of you weren't too kind. You're like, I know it was Splunk, and then uh, you lost me. Splunk needs a mind. There was actually some, some ladies that were here last week, and they encouraged me in the lobby. Like, you nailed it. Like, you actually pronounced it right. They're Greek, and they actually used this word. I didn't even know that. So Splunk needs a mind. Uh, it is this word that it takes compassion to a whole new level. And, um, and this is what the Samaritan possessed. He, he took pity on him. It says he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. This is God's word. And I believe this is God's word for you today. In the midst of a wounded world, what is your response? Two observations that we're going to go after today uh, is really looking at what, when it comes to loving our neighbor as ourself, what does it cost? And secondly, what does it require? Some of you are, uh, your reaction to anything and everything is, well, what's it cost? Right, you know who you are, what's it cost? Like you hear something, you're like, well, what's it cost? All right, so you're actually gonna like this talk. We're gonna talk about that, right? When it comes to loving our neighbor as ourselves, the truth is it does cost something. 
And secondly, it requires something. First, what does loving our neighbor as ourselves cost? To understand this, I want us to understand the context. So certainly the text, we'll get there, but the context is really important. I'm going to pull up verse 30 again on the screen. Uh, this is really important. A man was going down, say this with me, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So what, what's going on here? Why does this matter? Well, if you are a first century Jew... And you were there that day and you heard Jesus tell this incredible story. When Jesus added that um, aspect of the story, when he said Jerusalem to Jericho, your mind quickly went to a very real road. It was called Jericho Road. Everyone knew about Jericho Road. Uh, This was a road um, very different than like Rodeo Drive. Okay, so think of the opposite of Rodeo Drive. Jericho Road was a road you never wanted to go down. Jericho Road was fear. Jericho Road was... The kind of road that if you happen to be going down from Jerusalem, you just wanted to get to Jericho as quickly as humanly possible. You, you didn't like Jericho Road. It was dangerous. It's where people were robbed all the time. You were scared of it. In fact, you can even make the argument that maybe young Jewish boys would lie awake at night like being scared. Oh my gosh, what if we have to go down Jericho Road? Uh, for me, growing up in this community, we had a road similar to Jericho Road. Um, it's called Munger Road. Uh, I see, I thought this would be fun for those of us that grew up in this community that are roughly my age. Uh, do you guys remember like how, come on, how scared we were of Munger Road? Right. Okay. So this is what I was thinking about. So this is helpful then for 20% of you that get this. So you guys remember growing up, I went to Lake Park and, and even before the Medina Middle, we would tell all these stories about Munger Road. It was, I mean, it was haunted. I mean, for sure haunted. People died there all the time. Um, <laughs> Like if you, if you had to go down Munger Road just to get some street cred at school the next day, like I don't know what you guys were doing last night, but I went down Munger Road, right? So if you, if you had to go down Munger Road to get street cred, you just would never stop the car or get out of the car, right? So now things are different. Some of you are new to the area and you're like, I don't understand this. I live off of Munger Road. All right, just like you weren't here 20 years ago. I'm just saying it was bad, all right? So you did not want to go down Munger Road. So it's very similar to Jericho Road. And this is why I love the context. When we study God's word, we we study the text, but we also do the, I feel like, the fun work of understanding the context, the surrounding context. And so when Jesus, the master storyteller, tells this story, and he sets the story, the context of it on this road, no one wanted to go down. You and I start to understand and have a little bit of mercy for the priest and, and for the Levite. We start to understand a little bit more that maybe they're not as terrible as we made them out to be. Maybe they're just human. We start to understand, man, if I were that priest or if I were that Levite, I maybe not have, would not have stopped either. I, just like them, perhaps, would have wanted to just get to Jericho. And this really unlocks, I think, an understanding that Jesus is helping us get to of what does loving our neighbor cost? What, what, what does it cost? It costs a lot of things, but one thing it certainly costs is comfort. Loving, like this compassionate, splunknizomai kind of love, oftentimes will cost you the one thing you and I love, and that's comfort. So so don't leave me up here. I think I'm not the only one that loves comfort. How many of you are into seat warmers in your car, right? You don't even care if the engine works. You don't even care if it starts, as long as the seat warmers work, right? We're into comfort. Uh, I love sweatpants. I try to wear, I would preach in those if that were acceptable. I love sweatpants. Uh, I love seat warmers. I have one that works sometimes. I love slippers. I was in my slippers this morning. I love comfort. You love, we, this is what we all have in common. We are creatures of comfort. There's this term that you've heard of called a comfort zone. Show of hands. How many of you have heard of a comfort zone? You've probably used this term. This is interactive online as well. You can use the emoji online. You can put your hand up. Um, comfort zone. You have said things like, as, as have I, ah, that's just outside of my, yeah, it's just outside of my comfort zone. I would probably would do that, or I would go there, or I would say that, but it's just a little bit outside of my my comfort zone. And it's interesting, this term, it actually comes from a a range of climate degrees. I don't know if you knew this, but I had plenty of time this week, so I look into things like this. It actually comes from 67 to 78 degrees. This is where it actually arrived from, or derived from, this term comfort zone. They decided, I don't know who they are, but they decided that is the zone of comfort, 67 to 78 degrees, and I don't think we disagree with that, all right? They, they say in that temperature range, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just really comfortable. 
And so I want you to think about that temperature range for a second, and you're going to be a little sad because we won't experience that until probably, what, mid-June, right? But I want you to think about, as we're longing for this literal comfort zone, I want you to think about the amazing things that have happened in your life outside of that zone. Uh, how many of you loved going to the beach? Real quick, show of hands. Online, everybody, okay. I'm guessing when you go to the beach, it's outside of that comfort zone. It's north of 78 degrees. Some of you get tan, I burn, but some of you like to tan. Well, that usually happens north of 78 degrees. Think of all the amazing things that happen south of 67 degrees. Some of you like to go on snowmobile trips. Some of you, like me, love to snow ski down mountains. That's my, like, one of my favorite things. Well, that, that happens south of 67 degrees. Some of you have kids who love to sled and you like to make memories with your kids or you like to build snowmen or you, don't, you kind of deal with it. You just really like the picture to put on social media. Like all that happens south of 67 degrees. Why do I bring that up? I bring this up to be very practical. Like some of the most amazing memories and moments in your life have not happened within the literal comfort zone. And if you want to experience a story, your own life story, Moments that take your breath away, moments that make you feel alive, I promise you they happen outside of the zone of comfort. Loving your neighbor as yourself, it'll cost you a lot of things. One thing is the one thing that we love, many times more than even God, and that's our comfort. Some comfort is good. You don't have to email me about this, I get it. But when we make kind of the chief aim accidentally or subconsciously, the chief aim of our life, comfort, man, all of a sudden we pass right by like the priest and like the Levite. Verse 33 and 34, but a Samaritan went to him. I mean, he went to him. It says he, it, he bandaged his wounds. This guy had been beaten and stripped and he was bleeding all over the place. How many of you have ever had to bandage the wounds of someone bleeding? It's not an... It's not a comfortable situation. He probably got some of that guy's blood on him. He didn't even know him. Like, oh my goodness, th there's nothing comfortable about this. And he went to the man. Says he, he put the man on his own donkey. What's comfortable about that? Which means the good Samaritan was now walking. While this guy he didn't even know what it was his neighbor is now riding on his own donkey. What's comfortable about that? Think about how his feet must have hurt. Says then he brought him to an inn. And he took care of him. He didn't outsource this. Man, I'm good at that. Don't know about you. I'll see some stuff and I'll, I'll just, I'll, someone else. Someone else will do it. He took this personal. This cost him. And it needs to cost us love. It costs comfort. Which is why it requires courage. It requires courage. Loving your neighbor, this Splunk knees of my kind of love. I'll get into this love word a little bit more in a couple weeks on this agape love, what it really means. Man, it, it requires courage. Love requires courage. Say this with me. Love requires courage. It does. Th this word courage is the word of the year for me, by the way. It is. Um, I mean, this year has, I don't need to even talk about it. Um, we're ready for 2022. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this word courage has been so helpful. It helps me find my true north when I feel lost, um, when I feel disoriented, when I'm discouraged, like yesterday. I don't know, maybe you had a great Saturday. I didn't. Um, and I needed, I needed courage. Days when you and I would just rather quit. Uh, we'd, we'd just want to dig a hole and dive into it. Hopefully no one will notice. You need courage. You need courage not only to live right now, you need courage to love as Jesus would have you love. And I know you're tired and I know you're worn out and I know you're weary and I know you're frustrated and I know you're wondering when is ever things going to get back to some sense of normalcy. And if we're not careful, we can just opt out of life. We can opt out of the mission of God in a time where people need the love of God, perhaps more than any other time in our lives. We need courage, guys. We need courage. I need courage. I need courage to love people. I need courage to cross the street. I need courage to go to where people are at. I need courage. And when we think of courage, we, we think of other things like the Navy SEALs. I have this fixation with the Navy SEALs. Um, I don't swim very well, so I never would have made it. But I, I like watching all the documentaries. Like we think of the Navy SEALs, we think of courage. We think of skydiving. Uh, any of you ever skydived before? Like, I think of insurance policies and courage. Um, 
if you're raising middle schoolers, we think of courage, right? So we think of different things and we quickly associate that with courage. But when we talk about love, I'm just guessing you're like me, like the first thing that doesn't come to mind or even the top 10 isn't courage. But I'm just telling you, it is. Like to really love your neighbor in a costly kind of love, it, it requires courage. Why is that? Well, there's always a chasm between where you are and where they are. I don't know who the they is right now in your life. You may know them by name, you may not. But you know and I know that there is a chasm between you. As the priest and Levite are walking down Jericho Road on this side, and the guy laying half dead is on this side, they saw him, but more than seeing him, they saw the chasm that separated them. It was a, a chasm of costly love. It was a chasm of inconvenience. Perhaps it was a chasm of fatigue. I don't know. We don't know. But here's what I do know, and you know it too. Like for you to engage, you have to cross a chasm of some kind. If you begin to love your neighbor as yourself, you're, you're going to find all kinds of chasms. The chasm of awkwardness. Have you noticed that you don't choose your neighbors? You want to, as do I, but they moved in a couple months ago. Right? They're doing weird stuff. Real, real weird. You're like, honey, did you, did you see this guy? What's this, what's this guy doing? I mean, should we move? Should we call the, wh who do we call? What do we do? Like, is that illegal? I, right? Come on. Like, you've got that neighbor. Some of you have those neighbors. And if you're like, I don't have, you might be that neighbor. All right? So just, <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, there's a chasm of awkwardness at times. And you're just like, oh, my gosh. Like, you pull in, shut the garage. Like, all right, whew, we're good. There is a chasm of awkwardness at times. Uh, and it could be that neighbor or it could just be history. You've lived in that house for a really long time. And you started attending this church for the past few years, and we like, we like don't come off the gas on this live missionally thing and love your neighbors yourself thing. We just talk about it a lot, and you're just like, oh gosh, this is awkward. Um, you said hi last week, but you didn't for the last 10 years. It's just awkward. Um, Kelly and the girls, they deliver cookies to new neighbors that move on our street. Kelly and the girls do this. And, and there's, there's, times, there's times where it's, it's awkward because people don't go to people's door anymore or at least people that you don't want to, right? And so it, it, it can be awkward. We, we got to cross that chasm. There, there can be this chasm of just, just differentness. They're just different. Or you're just different than them. Um, they perhaps look different. They perhaps just do different things. There's a chasm of that. Um, chasm of fatigue, I, I feel like, is a very real chasm. And you see it. You see them. You see the issue. And then you're just like, um, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I, I don't think I, it's, it's a real chasm. Um, the chasm of interruption, and this is me a lot. I, and, um, I kind of get focused on my thing, what I'm going to do today and what I want to get done. And there's this war within me. Like there, I've been commanded to love people and yet I can love John a lot. So it's actually really good news for my neighbors when Jesus says, hey, love John, love your neighbors like you love John. That's actually really good news for my neighbors because I love John. Um, I don't like to be interrupted. I don't like to change my plans. And so here, here's what I want us to do just real quick. Um, I want us to, to leave Luke 10 for just a second, and I want us to go to Mark chapter 4. And what I'd love for you to do this week in your own time is I'd love for you to read Mark chapter 4. There's so much in this story. I'm only going to give you the thumbnail sketch. But the reason I want to, I want to go to Mark 4 real quick is when you're, when you're reading the, the Good Samaritan, I want you to always have one eye on the story and one eye on Jesus. He is the Good Samaritan. Every story whispers his name. Uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible says. And what's so awesome, guys, about, about Jesus, this one that you and I follow this, this king that I'm hoping some of you today would make the decision to follow for the first time. What's so awesome about Jesus is he doesn't just tell stories about love. You guys know people like this, but they don't do anything. Jesus, he did tell stories about love, but even more than that, he lived a life of love. And I just, I, I'm down with that. 
that inspires me, that moves me, that's like someone I want to follow. And so Mark chapter 4, it's so neat. In, in many ways, it's like this, it pairs so well with Luke 10. And I want to give you just a taste of it. Uh, Jesus, he's, um, he's with his disciples. And Jesus says something to his disciples that they never thought they'd ever hear with their Jewish ears. There's phrases in every cultural moment, every context that no one says. Like you just never hear. They, they had those kind of phrases. We, we have those phrases. Uh, one of our phrases you just will never hear is, um, I love the Elgin O'Hare Expressway. Right? So you've never heard that before. And you'd get a little freaked out if you heard that. You're like, isn't it great to spend $20 to go to streets of Woodfield? So you've never heard that before. So in their context, they have phrases that they never thought they'd ever hear. And Jesus says this phrase. It stops them dead in their tracks. Jesus says, Mark 4, 35, let's go over to the, to the other side. I can imagine Peter or Andrew being like, did he just say, did he just say other side? Yeah. You didn't go to the other side if you were a Jew. The other side, um, it was a place that you had to intentionally go to. You didn't go there on the other side. It was this region called the Decapolis. Uh, ten cities were there. They were pagan cities. Um, all kinds of um, stories were told about the other side. So you just didn't go. It was, it was dark over there. It was very demonic over there. The Yelp rating was very low over there. You just you didn't go. You never would even think about, why would we want to go to the other side? This is our side. Like, Jesus, are we good here? There's plenty of folks to love here. Why do we need to go over there? Well, there was one guy. You need to read about this one guy. They, they called him Legion. You can make the argument that at that moment, on planet Earth, he was the least likely human being to be set free. You can make the argument that he was the most marginalized human being on planet Earth at that moment. You can make a very good argument that this one guy, everyone had given up on. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, who doesn't just talk about love but is love, says, let's go to the other side. There's, there's someone over there who's in shackles, who's in darkness, and this is who I've come for. And they board up the boat and they set sail. And they get to the other side. And truthfully, it was worse than they had imagined. And they get there, and the 12 were terrified, and the one, Jesus, he was ready to do some transformative work. It's a story where this guy that was full of unimaginable pain came in contact with, one, with unparalleled love. This is what light is meant to do. It's meant to go to the darkness to drive it out. And this is what Jesus did. And this is what Jesus does. He, he goes over there to help disciple the disciples. That the kingdom of God, it's not limited to one side. My kingdom, Jesus says, it's not a kingdom of sides. I own it all. I'm sovereign over all of it. I have love for all of it. My love isn't restricted to one type of person. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I didn't come for those that are already walking in light. I came for those that feel like they can't make it one more day. Amen. Courage. I don't know what you think of when you are thinking of worshiping Jesus, but you are worshiping a God who is full of courageous love. He set the guy free. Everything changed when the love of Jesus showed up. And this question, I hope it interrupts your life in the midst of a wounded world. What is your response? I hope it looks like a million different things for us guys. But there's one thing we've been saying it definitely needs to look like. And that's for us to do something. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And so here in a second, you're going to see a story that we were able to capture a couple weeks ago, our team, and it's incredible, truly. Uh, today I'm asking that you would give $150 
at a minimum. If you're married, times that by two. Uh, last week we had a good start. We're about 44,000 in right now that we're going to give away. And I want us to do something. I want us to do something in a time where it's really easy to just hide out for the next six months. And as you're thinking about what's your response going to be today, I want you to think about her story. Let's go ahead and take a look now. I grew up um, on the north side of Chicago. I grew up in a very loving home, but um, there was a lot of turmoil. My mom was a single mom and she did the best that she could raising two little girls. The older I got, the more life started getting harder. I started um, hanging out with the wrong crowd. I started gang banging. Um, and in that, that's when I was introduced to the lifestyle of prostitution. When you're 16 and you have nowhere to go, you don't have a home, the little bit of family you do have ostracizes you. Very quickly you, you become, you start to become invisible. I actually completed high school. I have my diploma, but while I was in school, I was being trafficked. None of my teachers knew. I don't think anybody could have guessed because of the simple fact that I don't look like the typical person that something like this would happen to. Typically on average, it takes a woman about nine times to leave a trafficker. Um, I was probably on my like 10th time. I didn't have it in me, in the flesh, to physically walk away. Um, so God kind of had to make it a bigger, a much bigger picture for me to be able to walk away. My trafficker attempted to end my life and it was only because of my trafficker being removed and um, being arrested and being in prison that I was actually able to have a fighting chance to actually get away from him. I was actually introduced to Naomi's house while I was at a treatment facility. I never was a spiritual person. I never was a believer. I had never opened a Bible. Growing up in a life that's not spiritual, right? Like there was no moral compass for me growing up. So going into a program where the basic foundation of everything that is done is Jesus was scary. How do I have faith in someone that I can't see? How do I have faith in something I can't touch? But that's just a testament to why Naomi's house is so needed because if it weren't for them showing me like a very, very literally, like this is a different way of life, you can do this, I would be back doing the same exact things I was doing five years ago. Just the like love that Kim showed me in the like one hour that I was here, it really forever changed everything in my life. You know, I hadn't showered, my hair was a mess. I had been living out of a motel and she didn't care. And it was just that little bit of just like being seen, someone like seeing me, it just completely just did something to my soul. My life is just so different and it's just so humbling. When you have people who really want um, to see you succeed, it's overwhelming. <laughs> Can we show a round of applause for <clears throat> her story? And while we're applauding, let's applaud Naomi's house and the work that you guys are doing. Unbelievable. I think you can do better than that. Unbelievable. Thank you. Oh. I mean, this is, this is what Jesus does. He wants the, the folks that feel completely unseen to know that they are seen by him and by us. And I want to commend uh, one of our missional communities. They are partnering with Naomi's house, uh, 
Those ladies, they know who they are. I love that you are living on mission. I love that you're finding your mission by serving the women in Naomi's house. I love that so much. We want to commend what Naomi's house is doing. We want to commend her. You know, I'm not going to share her name, but we commend her for her courage. And, um, and we commend Jesus for his courageous love. A couple things and I'll be done. Have you surrendered your life for real to the love of Jesus? Have you done that? Jesus, he went to the other side for you, for your rescue on your worst day. When everyone had given up, when you had given up. And he's been there, whether you've felt his presence or not. And he's reaching out his hand to you right now. He's saying, come with me. Let me write an incredible story in and through your life. Have you surrendered to the love of Jesus? You can do that right now, you can do that today. Um, in fact, if you're watching online and you wanna do that right now, I want you to type into the comments, Jesus save me. Three words, Jesus save me. Someone from our team, they'll follow up with you. We wanna lead you to the most critical and important decision you could ever make in your life and that is to surrender to the most amazing love that there is. It's the love of Jesus, guys in the room. Have you done that? The second thing I, I want to encourage us with is to respond. Let's do this. Let's do this. Like, let's get excited about this. Let's support these organizations. We can make a difference. We really can. And we got a good start last week. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, some of you are wondering, John, how do I, how do I respond? Well, uh, there's a lot of ways. One way you can text the word give to the number 630. 538-8202. I think we, yep, right behind me. You guys are good. Um, you can text that. That's what I did. Super easy. Text the word give to that number. And you can respond with, with an amount there. Uh, a bunch of you guys, as I encouraged you with last week, buy some of the, the clothing. We sold out last week. We ordered more this week. Uh, so get something on your way out today. You can take a picture by the huge B4 banner. Uh, we want to use our collective social capital. It's a great way to get the word out. Uh, this video story, as is last week's, are available on YouTube. Just follow us on YouTube. You can text that story, the link, to all your friends. Why not? I mean, when's the last time they heard good news? And you can just say, hey, this is something my church is all about. Love to tell you more about it. We could do that. We could leverage technology. Uh, my hope and my prayer, my challenge to you is to do something. And so if you would right now, go ahead and stand to your feet. Let me pray for us as we finish up today. God, thank you for every person in this room. And thank you for every person online and at watch parties. One church, three venues, rallying around one cause that flows from your heart, God. To be for love. We want to be known as folks who love with a costly love. A love that requires courage. A love that costs comfort. Holy Spirit, come. Create the wave. Create the wave of generosity that can only be explained by your power. God, we thank you for this story that we just celebrated and we ask for thousands more. Thousands more. As we go about our life, God, may you put on our heart the women of Naomi's house. We pray for them all the time. We thank you, Jesus, for coming over, leaving heaven, crossing the greatest chasm, and rescuing us. May we never get tired of that, of thanking you for our rescue. We love you, and we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, amen. We are mission. See you guys next week.